This is an old song that I learned from my daddy. Uh, little old man come in from the plow, dan do, dan do. Little old man come in from the plow, Tommy Clash, Tom Klingo. Little old man come in from the plow, said old woman got dinner ready now. Blurred and blurred and black and dago. Piece old dry bread laying on the shelf. Dan do, dan do. Piece old dry bread laying on the shelf. Tommy Clash, Tom Klingo. Piece old dry bread laying on the shelf. If you want any dinner, you can cook it yourself. Blurred and blurred and black and dago. Vast lands were available. Crops were planted and harvested. The economy was strong as money poured into the hands of the producers. Then, the economy crashed. The rain stopped, and the people felt the stinging dust. In the aftermath, thousands were left to struggle, lest we forget the warning from forgotten lives. As the dust settled across the plains, inhabitants began to assess the damage. For as far as the eye could see, it was a scene from science fiction. Desolate and silent, colorless and gritty. Questions of the future would be on the minds of nature's victims, or were they humanity's victims? The Dust Bowl of the 1930s was an extraordinary period in environmental and human history. It was a benchmark between human complacency and changes that would protect the landscape from further degradation. Thomas Jefferson, then President of the United States, commissioned Lewis and Clark to explore the foreign land west of the Mississippi River. Along the way, they recorded their observations of the land, vegetation, and wildlife. The purpose was to assess the recent purchase from France and determine the possibility of expansion. As Lewis and Clark headed west, they would see a decrease in the amount of forest cover and an increase in the amount of tall grass prairie as they went from eastern Indiana into western Indiana. Uh, this tall grass prairie really uh, climaxed in central Illinois with grasses in height of 5 to as high as 10 feet. As Lewis and Clark headed west, though, the grassland height in general decreased. So in central Illinois, the grass is again 5 to 10 feet high. Once you got into eastern Nebraska, eastern Dakotas, grassland height was down to about 3 to as high as 5 feet. And then finally, once you got into the western high plains, you encountered the short grass prairie. And at that point, the grasses went down to maybe a foot to as high as maybe 3 or 4 feet in height. Through word of mouth of a vast land hopeful of prosperity, farmers from the east would push the frontier westward to reap the benefits of the land west of the Mississippi River. Once gold was found in the far west, opportunists began to make their own journey to increase their personal wealth, a chance to leave the horrors of debt and the drudgery of their lower class status. By the outbreak of the Civil War, railroad lines crisscrossed the landscape to provide food and supplies to the west and return nature's shining economic security to the east. Towns dotted the landscape between the east and the west where farmers took advantage of the vast land. Land that would provide wonderful economic opportunities unlike the conditions they left in the east. Farming in the east was difficult. Land was small, congested with old trees and rocky slopes. The amount of crops harvest would provide only a small profit after what was necessary to feed their family. Farmers dreamed of a land that was free from stumps that needed to be burned 
and boulders that had to be laboriously relocated. The Great Plains was the answer. Land where the horizon was void of branches of hardwood matting the soil with never-ending roots. It was a land of opportunity like no other with rolling hills of tall and short grasses. Green, lush, fertile, and undisturbed by human influence. Prior to settlement of the Great Plains, it was a massive, vast grassland that ran from southern and central Texas all the way up into southern Canada, Manitoba, uh, Alberta, and this massive uh, area of Great Plains was one of the largest, gr largest grassland complexes in the world. It can only be compared to the steppes of parts of Far Eastern Europe and Russia, as well as the Asia Minor area and the pompous areas of South America, which includes Paraguay and Uruguay. But by far, the, I really firmly believe that the largest expanse of grassland in the world, believe it or not, is right here in North America. Virgin land would soon be violated. It was a divine doctrine that the civilized would be given the opportunities provided by nature. Year by year, the farmers who lived on soil whose returns were diminished by unrotated crops were offered the virgin soil of the frontier at nominal prices. Their growing families depended more on lands, and these were dear. The competition of the unexhausted, cheap, and easily tilled prairie lands compelled the farmer either to go west and continue the exhaustion of the soil on a new frontier, or to adopt intensive culture. Thus the demand for land and the love of wilderness freedom drew the frontier ever onward. What was not considered in the equation thus far was the character of the land that was held secret for tens of thousands of years. Farmers of the East were aware of the climate pattern of their original land. Rains were common along the colonial East. If the rain stopped, farmers simply did what previous generations did to save their dwindling crops. Till the soil to bring moisture-laden soil to the top without the fear of it drying before the next rain. In the new landscape, farmers practiced what they knew would work during dry periods. But the rain seldom came in time. Tilling deeper to bring the much needed moisture to the roots of their crops, the result was devastating. Their method from the east failed. The relief they believed would come never arrived, thrusting dwindling crops to death. Eventually, the rains came back Relief returned and fear subsided, but for how long? At the turn of the century, the economy prospered. Industry provided evidence of growth. Cities boomed with success. The vast lands of the Great Plains were developed to supply the demand of urbanites, clearing the grasses from the fertile soils below. The Great War further demanded wheat and other crops to support the military campaigns of the British, French, eventually Americans battling the Germans on the westward front in Europe. Because of the demand, crop prices were at their highest. Farmers finally reaped the benefits of the land. More land was needed to supply the elevated demand. Technology made it possible. Teams of horses turned into mechanized creatures tearing through the earth. The future was golden, but looming behind the happiness of the farmer's success was a disaster beyond human comprehension. On Black Tuesday, 1929, the financial support of families, businesses, and farmers abruptly ended. All banks closed. The foundation that had allowed farmers to obtain credit in the past tumbled, leaving nothing for the future. In the financial aftermath, the rains began to diminish across the plains, doubling the hardship for all concerned. Days turned to months. Months turned to years, and the harsh sun baked the land. Farmers did their best to provide moisture for their wilting crops by tilling deeper. By the time they finished tilling a field, the sun had completely finished off the remaining moisture. Each time a machine turned the soil to increase moisture, the soil lost an important physical character. Good soil holds together as a clod. A clod has small holes and bubbles that allows water to collect and remain in the soil longer. As tractors and teams of horses drive across the soil, it becomes compacted. Unlike moist soil, dry soil crushes into a fine powder, unable to absorb moisture when it does rain. The result is runoff. To compound problems, 
Not only are the Great Plains known for the vast grasslands, they are well known for persistent gusty winds. The powdered soil, light and gritty, eroded away creating clouds of dust. There was nothing to hold it down. Treeless fields made it easy for the winds to sweep across the landscape unrestricted. April 14, 1935. A day in American environmental history known as Black Sunday. Over the horizon, an ominous cloud of doom sent shivers of fear through the spines of the inhabitants of western Kansas. Many were unsure what was coming for them. Many believed it was the end of the earth. It was similar to a north storm that many had witnessed for years, but this one was different. In the north, and thought it was the blue norther coming. Such a huge black cloud, just looked like a smoke out of a train stack or something. I just come a rolling over, and when it got near to the house, we was all afraid, and we ran into the storm house because we thought it was a storm. And uh, we lit the lamp, and it was just so dark in there that we couldn't see one another. We just had, to, even with the lamp lit, and we just soaked and smothered. And my husband was out after the cows, and he stumbled up against the barbed wire fence, and he followed the fence till he come to the house, is the way he was able to get to the house. And uh, we had to tie wet rags over our mouth, and just to keep from smothering, we dip cloths in buckets of water and tied over our mouth down the cellar. And that one lasted so fierce for about two hours, and then we took courage and see we wasn't going to blow away, and we went in the house. And we wet blankets and hung over the windows. And uh, then after the first one, of course, we were scared, awfully dead. And the old timers said they'd never seen nothing like that. It's been so fine. I can tell you the story about the dust storm I experienced was about uh, 1933, I believe it was. It was in the early, in the late summer, I believe it was. They come a, what we call a red dust storm. It's come from the west, from the red country west of us. And it just it done lots of damage to the small buildings, blowed them completely away and tore the, build, the roofs off of the larger buildings. Some of them blowed the windows out of the houses. Turn cars over and things like that, straight wind, no twister to it. And the dust was so thick that you could see nothing at all. You just absolutely couldn't see through it at all. Just dark as it could possibly be. And it was that way for about 14 hours. It blowed steady that way. It seemed like there no let up at all. It was as strong as it could be. You couldn't walk in it. When major drought hit the plains in the 30s, uh, you already had the vegetation removed by cultivation. Prior to the 30s, there was a period that ran uh, from about 19, roughly 1920, right up into uh, to about 1930, uh, where we had very beneficial rains in the plains. So that actually caused more prairie to be uh, plowed in the plains and more areas to be cultivated. The problem was that without any prairie grass cover, which was the natural vegetation, when drought did hit in the 30s, the soil blew everywhere. And that caused a massive, massive erosion on a scale that probably had never, ever been seen in the plains, or at least hadn't been seen in the plains since the major, major mega droughts, uh, maybe the 1600s or certainly during the very last, very warm, dry period during medieval times. So it's highly likely that the Great Plains was the worst dust bowl since medieval times in the plains. As the dust engulfed the air, many suffered from breathing problems. Livestock fell to the knees choked from the harsh, gritty air. Inhaled dust became mud and moist lungs. Death soon followed. And we had cattle. We had cows that we gave $60 and some $90 in pure old money and we it killed them they was out in there and uh, we uh, would cut their lungs open and it looked just like a mud pack or something. it just really showed it was the mud health issues were commonplace throughout the plains children suffered the most cloth masks were worn to keep dust out of the nose mouth and lungs 
but this seldom worked due to the fine size of the dust particles. The common malady throughout the plains was dust pneumonia. Homes throughout the plains were no fort against the swirling dust. Every space left open allowed dust to blow through, making the interior difficult to see other inhabitants. Dust piled on tables and other objects, making cleaning difficult. When people went to bed and awoke the next day, a silhouette of their head was left from the settling dust. No matter how much families tried, the dust became a way of life. Our house is sealed, but that dust comes through somehow. Even those stucco houses lie all around the doors and the windows. The dust would be all piled so high. And you just had to mop real good when it was over to get it out. You just couldn't get it out no other way. The scene repeated week after week, month after month. Confusion and despair were commonplace. During this period, the man provided for his family. The success of his crop brought food to the table. But the destruction left in the wake of drifts of dust made farmers believe they had let their families down. How will we continue? Where are the rains? What am I going to do? Are we going to die? These were the questions asked by distressed farmers as they looked across the former green and lush landscape. When the storms let up in frequency, the land lay barren of the important ingredient in raising crops, the topsoil. Most of the topsoil ended up in the eastern cities. In Chicago, it was reported that approximately four pounds of dust per person fell over the city. During extremely gusty conditions, there were reports of ships covered with a light blanket of dust in the Atlantic Ocean. The impact of the Great Plains did not concern Washington until dust filled the air throughout the city. Washington's response was establishing a soil conservation service to reverse the damage already done. To educate future farmers of the causes of the Dust Bowl, the government produced the film, The Plow That Broke the Plains. The film put the blame on farmers who modified the land without restriction and regard for the fragile environment. The first fence. Progress came to the plains. For some, relief was too late. Forced from their homes established several generations before, they hit the road without a planned route except west. Everything they owned was packed in one vehicle. Mattresses, chairs, blankets, pots and pans, clothes, shoes and personal objects to remember the happy days of long ago were piled high. The future was foggy. A life of happiness left when the rain stopped. It was almost as if the winds blew their lives away. As families pulled away from the front door of their home, they tried to show strength by not looking back at the place that brought so much happiness and prosperity. A place that they believed would always be a firmament for future generations. But it was a scarce, lifeless place. The hardiest of humans would not be allowed to prevail over the land. The land won the battle. Unforgiving of what humans did, the land laughed as families drove down their lane for the last time. It was almost as if nature was giving humans a taste of their own medicine. Unable to practice their livelihood, the future prospect of success was very small. All that they could do was dream of a place that would provide food, the staple of the future. Given the chance, former Plains farmers would do anything to provide for their families a place to sleep and meat to eat. Each hour sitting in the truck with the only possessions they had, they were probably thinking where they went wrong. Answers were less in number than the questions. Most of the questions concerned how to get through the day. Silent with distress, the only sounds adults heard were the laughter of children unaware of the future except the excitement of going to a new place. A better landscape than the barren land they could not play in. 
the future was too far in the distance. Each mile was more important than a hundred miles. Unsure where the nightfall would stop them, food was the primary thought. As they migrated from the plains, they were strangers among thousands of strangers doing the same thing, finding the promised land where jobs and food were plentiful. The possible opportunities not sought by the individual, but by the masses. By the time a secure job was within reach, it was taken by another struggling family or the crop was devastated by starving wildlife. A story of such a situation was recorded by Imogene Chapin as she and her family moved from camp to camp only to arrive in California with seven cents to her name. We left our home in Arkansas. It was in the month of June. To find a job away out west, of course we'd find one soon. We headed for Missouri, the old show me state. But jobs were scarce, they all told us. You're just a little late. <clears throat> then on to Kansas we did go, the state that grows the wheat. In harvest we would work a while. We'd have good things to eat. There's work for everyone we thought. In fact, we almost knew it. They only shook their heads and said, the hoppers beat you to it. We would not let our spirits sink. We'd find work on the farm. I've heard it said most all my life, the third time is the charm. We'd go to Colorado, where all the lettuce grows. We had to cross the Rockies. We almost froze our nose. We thought we'd stop and ask for work and find a place to stay. A sandstorm beat us to that job and blew it all away. They told us then of Utah, some work we'd surely find. The cherry trees were ripe with fruit, the people all were kind. <clears throat> so once again we headed, our quiver down the hill. There was no doubt we really knew our pocketbooks we'd fill. But like the other places, a freeze just struck there. And there was no job for us at all, the cherry trees were bare. No work in Arizona or Nevada, so they say. So on to California, we started on our way. They said in California that money grew on trees, that everyone was going there just like a swarm of bees. We landed here one summer day. How hot, I can't quite tell. I'll leave the rest of you to guess. I know you can quite well. The goat heads punctured our old shoes. The sun had baked our brain. We stayed out here about three months before we saw rain. The ants, they bite. The flies, they buzz. Mosquitoes call you cousin. And when you try to take a nap, they bite you by the dozen. We drink our coffee from tin cans, eat sardines by the peck. If I could catch that fisherman, I'd break his gosh darn neck. We eat soup beans three times a day. We sleep on the floor. I guess you're tired of reading this, or I would write some more. I guess you wonder who wrote this. I know you think I'm crazy. You do not miss it very much. My brain is rather hazy. I tried so hard to find the trees on which the money grows. I walk through this hot sand so much, it's blistered by poor toes. Perhaps the money has all fell off, or just a little late. The one who wrote this crazy thing lives in cabin 228. Migrating families most often found themselves searching for jobs that were already taken. Leaflets were received promising jobs giving people a bit of hope. But due to the lack of mass communication, people didn't realize the vast extent of the drought and its influence on so many. In 1939, the rains returned, ending the greatest drought in North American history. Out of the chaos of the last decade, only a handful survived the Dust Bowl. But it were those people that migrated westward that truly survived the ridicule, the hard times, the starvation, the stress of finding a job, wondering when the next meal would come. The forgotten thousands were the storytellers for the future. Would the lessons they left in the fields of dust be forgotten? All citizens of the United States suffered, not just the farmers. What made this event so significant was twofold. Humanity's desire for wealth amplified by nature's natural fluctuation. In the final analysis, Thousands would provide future generations with the answer to success and prosperity. Understand the limits posed by the natural environment. Never take nature for granted, for it's as fragile as the most delicate flower. 
The benefit of nature does not come from overusing it. Balance the use and the profit of the future will tenfold providing future generations with prosperity. Our children's children will be successful only if our motive is to protect the future of the natural environment. Each disaster we witness in the future will be a reflection of what our ancestors experienced. What we do today will influence the future. Understanding the past is the key to the future. Remaining complacent brings only destruction for future inhabitants of our earth. The lives that experience the devastation have willed us an important lesson. Nature is uncontrollable for human purposes. Understand it and relish in its splendor.